I uh, give everyone a pat on the back who came along to a session that talked about vanity and ego being a barrier to measurement. So well done and thanks for being here. I'm Marion, obviously. I think most people know who I am by now, but I'm joined by a wonderful panel on stage this morning. Please welcome them again, Lavanya, Carly, and Christopher. <laughs> and deliberately chosen because the issue that we're speaking about today is very relevant to all of their businesses. The fashion business and the automotive businesses, not short of an ego, lots of competing <laughs> interests but also lots more measurement and data around all of their businesses. And Carly's perspective, of course, is across many different industries. And that's um, a different perspective on what happens when the campaign has been reported on and what happens to egos internally. So we're addressing, as I said, the little discussed barrier to measurement today of vanity and ego, and also how we balance room for creative experimentation in a business culture that's really primed for success primarily. Um, up, to, up front, I'd like to say I'm very thankful to Jim McNamara. Is he in here? Jim? If you are, thank you very much. Jim gave me a lot of um, research history on this barrier and guided me also on research methods. So during this presentation, I will also share um, some findings from 10 one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews that I conducted um, with Jim's helpful input and advice to get a variety of perspectives before I pass over to the panel to share personal experiences and answer your questions on the issue as well. Um, I'm going to start off by showing an example of what happens when measurement experts come in and, and sometimes thwart that room for experimentation and creativity. And I want to share with you um, a very important fashion collection. If any of you recognise it, this was Marc Jacobs' show for Perry Ellis in 1993. It was his spring, summer, 93 collection. And it is a tale of legendary creativity because after being with the company for four years, Jacob's politely done a few seasons of their traditional style of fashion, fitting with the brand ethos. And then in this show, he tore things up with a really controversial show in New York Fashion Week. And it was an ode to the Seattle grunge scene, something that no one had done in fashion before. These chiffon dresses with Doc Martens, these tie-dyed flannel shirts, a very rough street look and the reviews and the critique of the collection absolutely slated him. And in fact, it ended his career. Shortly after collecting a Designer of the Year award, <laughs> proof that awards are a guarantee of success, um, he, Perry Ellis fired Mark Jacobs and shut down production on the line completely. Although Mark Jacobs, of course, obviously lived on very successfully after this. Now, had um, Perry Ellis called in a fine example like the Measurement Company of the Year to evaluate his campaign, uh, we would likely have done something like applying the AMEC integrated framework to this campaign and uh, looked at the business objectives to sell out the collection, analyse the outputs of the campaign. It was, in fact, the highest ever media impressions for a fashion collection in history. And then when we go to looking at the outcomes and the impact, the media analysis showed it was 98% unfavourable coverage of the campaign and the world's most influential fashion commentator, Susie Menkes, declared the collection ghastly and created fashion badges for everyone to wear declaring that. And the business impact, of course, that he was fired and production was shut down on the collection. So when we look at a framework like that, we start to ask questions of the measurement systems we've created and how they allow room for creative experimentation and also a little bit of ego and vanity in the marketing process as well. To apply a framework like this requires lots of discussion up front with a client team and it has to be flexible and useful to creative experimentation, something that I know Carly will refer to a little later. Um, and it's likely Mark Jacobs, I would guess, stormed out, declaring his bosses wouldn't know a creative idea if it, um, let me just advance the slide there. Thank you. And yeah, it's likely he that he uh, stormed out, declaring his bosses wouldn't know a creative idea if they saw one. And yet to this day, that collection has been celebrated as an iconic collection in the fashion world, despite the fact that in traditional measurement, 
of course, it was not considered very successful at all. There are a lot of parallels, of course, between the measurement industry and my first career. Um, some of you know this, I'm slightly embarrassed to admit, I was a Deloitte's auditor for five years. Auditors, <laughs> I did not understand creativity very well in my first career at all, <laughs> because smashing down clients' accounting decisions and forcing them to correct their errors is not very good preparation for a future accounting career. And in fact, one of my clients stuck this definition up in the auditing room one year when I turned up. Oh, here they come. The people who go in after the battle is won or lost and slay the wounded behind them. And in a way, when we're doing summative measurement, as Chim labelled it earlier, that's exactly what we're doing, is we are going in after the battle and slaying the wounded um, if there's any bad news. So that's a lot like what we do. And as many of us know about summative measurement, at the end of a campaign, it's typically it's motivated by defence, filled with vanity metrics, that's ultimately fairly superficial. It's seeking success, generally. But this shouldn't happen anymore. We've had really good industry standards for measurement already since 2010, when we first agreed the Barcelona principles. Yet, in a survey barely six months ago, we saw that Euro European practitioners were using these measures, typically. Vanity metrics, AVEs, coverage, impressions, qualitative metrics, tone, sentiment. Finally, what Christopher was talking about yesterday is understanding, tracking your influences, and then at last we get to some business impact. So a sad condemnation of what we are actually doing compared to the standards that we've set ourselves in the industry. And in summary, less than half of the people had even heard of the Barcelona principles. A quarter could describe them and 11% actually used them. That's six months ago, a survey European practitioners by Amec. Why is this? And why, sadly, has little changed in the last three decades? Well, as Jim highlighted for me when I look back at some historical research, this has been the case right back to 1983, when we saw one of the first published studies around what was holding marketers back from embracing measurement. And back then, at least people were brave enough to admit that one of the big issues was fear. Fear of being measured, and lots of enthusiastic talk about the need for it, but actually little utilisation in practice. And then just when we thought things would get better with social media and lots of new data that we could measure, things got much worse. How did this happen? Well, we got even more social metrics, even more vanity metrics in the form of social media counting. Marketers obsessively counting their followings. And of course, my organisation does the same at Ogilvy. We're just as pleased about how many followers and people retweet our tweets to. This is a slide shot I've taken from a presentation, quite a controversial one last year, given in Australia by Professor Mark Ritson from Melbourne University. He analysed the top 10 brands in Australia, removing B2B brands, and looked at what were their followers compared to the number of customers they serve from published information. So number of customers here in the millions for these top 10 brands, number of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram followers. These numbers look big, sexy, and easy to count. But of course, in practice, when we start working out, putting them in context, and looking at percentages, they're ludicrously low. Have a look at these for top 10 brands in Australia, connecting with two to 8% of their fans through Facebook and spending most of the time on measurement around count, counting these shiny vanity metrics. So why, three decades on, are a mere 11% of marketers willing to follow the measurement geeks? And why are we not making more progress? There must be some other barrier that's holding us back that means the room is this full instead of 2,000 people saying, how can I solve this? In fact, why doesn't Amec have more members obsessed with the topic? What are the barriers holding people back? One of the big ones I certainly got from interviews with CCOs, regional chief communication officers and PR leaders was because we take away their candy. When they talk to us, all the measures that they love, we deride and we rip away from them. Every measure that marketers cling to, likes, clicks, fans and so on, measurement experts come in and say, not good enough. 
that's not the important issue here. You've got to get connected to business measures. So we make them feel a bit like criminals for a connect. No, man. I need some clicks. Okay, okay. I got some choice clicks right here, yo. Impressions, page views, followers. How about likes? You got some likes? I just need enough to get me through this quarter. What are you in for? Clicks. That must be a measurement expert in the middle who slid away from them. <laughs> Um, but, as we all know, the communications industry is not short of an ego or two in both clients and in agencies, or we wouldn't have the Amec Awards last night, or racing up on stage eager to get recognition for our great work. So we can't ignore this factor, even though we say these aren't the right measures. This next quote that someone shared with me, and the source will remain unnamed, um, really, for me, helped get underneath the skin of the fear barrier. Someone actually admitting they'd forego measurement in exchange for never being proven a failure was a really good insight into the problem here. So think of all the clients you've worked with if you're in a measurement agency who've not gone ahead with measurement projects and start to question the reasons why. And as marketers, and I've been on both sides of the fence, both client side and agency side, think of all the campaigns that you hoped the CFO or procurement would never target for review and dig too deep into your reports on the measures. And we start to understand this issue. Here are some of the truths, of course, that PR people never want their CEO, CFO slash procurement, um, sometimes even CMO to see. One of these, of course, is the great myth about impressions. Are these just alternative facts? Fake news? <laughs> Um, I work, anyone who works across um, the Chinese region as well, of course, is used to seeing massive numbers. So I judge award entries and people put in their 100,000 likes or views of something. I say, I work with China. Unless you've got a billion, I'm not even impressed. But of course, we all know the reality of impressions. Completely meaningless and as uh, the line says, <laughs> most completely wasted, never even seen, as is the problem here with online measures. Up to 40% of the online measures are garbage. They're generated by bots. In China, you can create your own bot. Just Google how to create your own bot, and you too can generate millions of views for your content and boost your vanity metrics, like the guy we just saw hauled up for doing the same thing. Um, and of course, even Facebook admits that only 3% of content on Facebook is ever seen. And we all know, of course, what a video view means on Facebook now, don't we, and on YouTube? <laughs> it means you saw that fraction of a second of the video and you're counted as a view, very useful. And then, of course, we see even more garbage like the social media version of ad value equivalency, which I know I've had to stop in one or two of our offices in Asia before, or the value of a like. And we've all seen studies around this, I'm sure, as well. What is the value of a like for brands? So, as I said, to get under the skin of this a bit more, I spoke with 10 people um, in one-on-one -on -one phone interviews. Uh, as Jim wisely counseled me, no one's ever going to admit this in a quantitative survey, so you'll need to get under the skin of it. So, in speaking with um, regional chief communication officers and PR leads, uh, global research industry leaders, and I also spoke with Paul Holmes, who you may be familiar with, um, who publishes the Holmes Report, um, commentator on the PR industry, but is of course a journalist, not a PR practitioner or a measurement expert. And some very interesting points of view came up that I'd like to share and then ask the panel also to comment on from their experience after this as well. The first of these was, is it really egos or is it this data phobia? Oh, data, sorry, data, some of you say data, data. Um, and that's that fear point I was talking about for in that original fear quote, fear of being measured. Measurement is not a place of comfort for most people in marketing. It's been thrust really upon the CCOs and marketers to some extent as well. And it's always implied when you do it that you are proving success. Very rarely do you brief a measurement project going in saying, find where we fell down, find what went wrong. Jim's study he shared earlier is quite unusual to go back retrospectively and find where were the problems, where were the warning signs, because most of us go in look, looking tuned for success. What were the success indicators? 
The other point that was raised by several people is that um, it really needs to shift from backward looking to being able to predict the future. The more I can do measurement in order to shape a better campaign next time or next year, the more comfortable I am with insights that help us improve versus tell us what we, what we got wrong in the past. And then, of course, Jim spoke about this river of data, as I call it this morning. Everyone chasing the, the data-driven outcome here. Um, and numbers, and Jim alluded to this as well, all in different silos, very difficult to connect the data together or to access it across departments. And I believe organizations like Zalor, and I'm, Christopher, I'll look to you to comment on this as well, is how you make sure that data is fully shared across an organization when it's owned by different parties. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Jarman yesterday from Microsoft. He's in a global role overseeing what they call 16 regions. And he talked about the importance of the fact that you need some time out to actually comb through some micro level data to start to see some differences and some patterns and generate new insights because the more senior you get in an organization, the less time you have to do that. And the more reliant you are on people <coughs> below you to be able to bring it to your attention and highlight it, force that time in your agenda to see it. Um, and if you don't have it, then you tend to revert to clutching to the very much the favoured measures. Um, I know Carly is going to speak to this next point as well, and that is, if we do actually get to a report stage, so we've done the work, here's where egos come back into play. Reports needing to be supplied in non-editable formats now to clients, so the data can't be massaged. Um, requests often, we spoke about requests to um, have some data removed, have negative comments removed from reports, remove some compet competitor data, redefine the competitive set to try and make the data look a little better in a final report. I, I'm sure none of you know what we're talking about here. <laughs> um, clients calling up upset about reports. Uh, you've misinterpreted the data, I can see it another way. <laughs> or um, maybe even using it as a weapon internally by other departments in the organization. Um, Carly and I had a really good chat, and I'd love you to share some of this too, about the importance of workshopping a report with the client first before it's actually issued. So to understand what the data is indicating, workshopping, putting some context around that, getting general comfort and agreement with the client before that report is issued to help them understand what's coming and how can we express it in a forward-looking way that identifies a future opportunity to apply it, as Jarman said yesterday, also with the Microsoft case. I had a fascinating conversation with another regional CCO who said um, they had outlived six CEOs and countless marketing directors over a 15-year period. And highlighted to me, you need to remember that marketing live and die by quarters. Reputation does not move that fast, unless it's a crisis, of course. And marketing's view is I'm not investing in something you can't cash in on in a quarter. So how can I get something that does mean something to me within the same measurement period that I'm looking at? This CCO caution that you forget vanity metrics at your peril. As shiny, social, feel-good metrics are very important to win support for the longer-term work around relationship and reputation building. And she introduced this concept to me of pulling everyone in your team, senior leadership in your team, under the vanity umbrella. She called it my new term for, this, um, for researching this subject. The vanity umbrella is where you get everyone together, you make them part of the success, you run your internal hype campaign, your internal PR for what the campaign generated, just as well as you run your external PR campaign. So the importance of understanding the internal and the external PR, which we heard earlier from Fritz yesterday, is promoting your results internally too. So create those visibility, uh, create that visibility and perceptions of short-term impact and bring up the long-term work and the long-term impact when you start to see the change in things like brand health tracking. Australians love a colourful turn of phrase, a great expression that tells it straight, you may have noticed. <laughs> And the CCO also asserted, you can't win in a chief um, communications officer role by simply building reputation and preventing crises. 
that may not pay out for three years. Marketers and CEOs need to pay the checks quarterly. So make sure you align your objectives and your timelines as much as possible. And if you need to, think about how you phase your budgets also so that you can be delivering the same vanity metrics, the quarterly metrics that they need that fit with their objectives. So in other words, she said, play to the short attention spans but remember, you have to answer to shareholders longer term, and you really need to be that person who helps the CEO balance short term and long term decisions for the organisation. I also had just briefly a very interesting chat with uh, someone based in Japan who has an, a very in depth knowledge of this market, is Japanese national. And he said, when you get to Japan, since we're focusing on the Asia Pacific region, is you need to remember that tier one companies still have lifelong employment. You join as a graduate and you retire at your 65, having been a generalist most of the time in the company. That is, you may be rotated every two to three years into different roles. As a result, when you land in a comms role or a marketing role, and you need to prove effectiveness of work, you do not challenge what's been done by those of you beforehand because you're not the specialist either. You need to play it safe. If you need to do some post-rationalization, it's generally blamed on changing industry factors that could not be foreseen as you started the campaign. Okay, but most measurement is a post-rationalization. This is, however, changing rapidly. There are now about 2.6 million foreign passport holders working in Japan. That's about the equivalent of a city, the city the size of Nagoya. So that's a very significant workforce that is starting to change that culture. Um, but it will happen very slowly. Paul Holmes had some very outspoken views on the subject too, and I'll share his views directly with his name attributed to them. Um, and his view was that PR can outperform marketing in many, in fact, he dared to say, most instances in terms of ROI. And we've seen the published studies, and many of you I'm sure would be familiar with them, published studies on market mix modeling, comparing their returns between different touch points, marketing touch points. But PR people appear reluctant to believe them. And agencies either show a lack of ambition or they're too compliant with client desired measures to rock the boat. Paul shared that still around 50% of the Sabre Award entries he sees have little more than impressions or opportunities to see in the case of European markets as their measures, and still many use AVE. And he's even seen in judging panels, CCOs very skeptical of linking PR's role to any business outcomes, who questioned entries that have dared to prove they've delivered a business outcome. His view was that as long as PR budgets are small relative to marketing budgets, it won't get too much CFO or CEO attention in the short term. And that was important, and as I was thinking about what do we do to change this, we discussed together the, um, the importance of university level education, things like Amic College, that help to change views and attitudes to embracing measurement. So the next generation of marketers feels more equipped and more comfortable with this issue. Um, Fritz uh, spoke yesterday on this, and, and thank you for the credit. I'm proud to say that American Express is a client who works with Ogilvy regularly on workshops to improve measurement and to review and share their measurement approaches. Sorry? No more money. <laughs> <laughs> I heard more money. Did anyone else hear more money? <laughs> um, <laughs> Jim McNamara, as always, provided very wise counsel. And his words very simply were that we need to for normalize failure or we have no opportunities to improve. And this is our big blind spot. We live in business cultures that are increasingly forcing us to prove success. That demand, expect, that go into measurement, expecting the outcome will be what a great success your campaign was. There are no awards that celebrate failure and the great insight that came from them. And in fact, it's rare that we have the courage to enter an award and say, we're entering a campaign that was actually a big failure and we had tremendous learnings from it. That would take an immense amount of courage. Jim's words were that we need to stop treating PR measurement like a performance evaluation and understand that it's the process of improving with insight. Because of course, what will ever change? If we keep getting reports back, 
from our measurement agencies that tell us what a great job we did and we keep creating them internally, we will continue to believe we are terrific marketers with no faults and don't need to improve. So, you know, heeding Jim's words, I would encourage us to all change our name badges for the rest of the conference to say, hello, my name is Failure. Because you will be more successful long term if you can boast about and talk about those failures as part of the insight process and how we will improve in the future. And that really ties back to that comment about um, evaluation should be more forward looking, should be more predictive and you can't get to that unless you find the failures and determine how you can change your approach so that we don't see them again in the future. So finally, before I hand over to the panel, I'd like to share a few recommendations um, that I developed in speaking with the experts. Um, the first and obvious easy one of those is to just <laughs> avoid measurement. <laughs> Never be proven foolish. You'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> but presuming you've come to Bangkok to do a little, uh, have a little smarter approach than that, um, a lot of our commenta commentators, and I'm sure the panel will share also, is to understand where the pain points are, firstly for PR in an organisation. Is it low organisational credibility? Is it claims of success that are being disputed by other teams, especially marketing? Is PR trivialised or ignored for lack of data? Are corporate decisions often blind to the potential reputation damage? Just ask United Airlines what we mean by that one. And is PR often abused for ego purposes? And I'm sure all of us have seen instances where senior management have asked for PR to profile a CEO or to build somebody's ego or to make the organization look better at a time that it needed some positive profiling. So find those pain points and leverage them. To also heed the lesson from the wise CEO who shared the vanity umbrella story with me, to make sure you're combining both vanity metrics and business measures to meet the needs of different stakeholders and business units here. So satisfying the short term and the long term, understanding the different time frames that marketing and communications are operating in. Last year at the Amec London Summit, I spoke about integrated measurement and the importance that we reorient measurement towards the integrated marketing mix. So my third recommendation here is to help solve PR's place in what I call the measurement fruit salad. One of my favorite slides this year, <laughs> Carly knows, we've both used it. <laughs> About when we did the AMEC Awards webinar, we both had the same slide in here, didn't we? <laughs> yes, um, and this has happened because there's been such a proliferation of channels for great integrated work. Back in the 90s, for those of you who were around, like Deepa and myself back then, when we were just getting computers, there was an average of three channels used in a marketing campaign. By 2010, we saw an average of seven channels, and this is taken from analysis of global entries into the IPA Effectiveness Awards and the WAC Effectiveness Prize to understand the number of channels. Now, interestingly, the people who've analyzed this data also proved that the optimum number of channels per campaign was three or four. In fact, that campaigns that only use one channel had about a 59% success rate, rising to 74% success rate for campaigns with three channels. And then interesting after there, law of diminishing returns, it drops right back down. For five channel campaigns, that success rate falls to 57%. But I'm sure you're all familiar with what I mean, the number of rising touch points that we see in campaigns. When there is one audience, we need to bring together all of the contributing factors in attribution and consider those results all together. We see far too much of, but what was the impact of PR alone? When it's extremely difficult and in fact not valuable to determine perhaps the impact of PR alone because it had a cumulative effect with other marketing touch points, made them more effective, prolonged the conversation, extended it or made it a deeper conversation as you know. So we need a more complete picture. We need attribution of different sources. And the final point I wanted to share is if you're educating clients and your own teams on this is to start very simple and build up slowly. I joined Amic in 2012, I think it was, all guns blazing, got so much out of my first conference. I came back and I'd created the half day measurement workshop for our Ogilvy teams. And I, in the first two years, I'd educated 800 Ogilvy staff across our region on measurement education in a half day workshop. 
Did measurement improve in the following year? <laughs> For most people, I'd scared them. Just made it too complex. I now run a one hour introductory measurement workshop and I keep it much simpler. Um, Fritz knows this, I share this with clients regularly. I now talk about three measurement buckets. Feel free to borrow my buckets. Um, never mind integrated framework, I'm back at buckets. <laughs> so I used to call them, of course, outputs, impact, and outcomes. And I used to help people take their measures and sort them into these three buckets. I now keep it much simpler. Now I call them the what, the coverage the impressions, opportunities to see, your likes, your video views, your tweets, etc. all these lovely simple output measures, the what. The second bucket I call the so what. Did anyone care a week later? Who remembers? How has it changed impression about the brand? Is anyone recommending the brand as a result? Is anyone say they're more likely to buy as a result? So the so what bucket. And finally, my favorite, the show me the money bucket if you're familiar with the movie. Um, and this is where we talk about business outcome. So what was the impact on sales, market share? It might be um, pre-orders for something in the gaming industry. It could be memberships, sign-ups, um, new accounts opened on Zalora, people who've come into a dealership and put down a deposit on a car. These are the, where we get to connecting it to real business results. So the what, the so what, and the show me the money. It's gotten really sophisticated, Ogilvy. <laughs> but you know what? It's the way in to make it simpler and avoid some of the fear. That fear is what is behind that ego barrier is I'm scared of proving it because it seems so scary because there's too much data because it's quite difficult to understand. The simpler I can make it and we can make it as an industry to help get people in the better chance we have of success. With that, I'm gonna stop talking for a little bit and pass over to each of our panel to ask them for some commentary also on their experiences and personal stories and organizations. I'm gonna start with Lavanya. Thank you, Lavanya. Thanks, Marion, that was very interesting. I think um, lots of insights into it. Uh, if I share from my perspective of five years in Nissan, uh, an automotive company, and I yesterday spoke about how we need to be tying it every day to business and sales. The end result is sell a car. Um, if I look at the journey that we went through as communications function globally, I'm not alone in this. There's a huge team that's working at the global level trying to understand how do we build PR measurement into the business. And one of the things that we started realizing is we enter very late when a product is getting positioned. So we enter just before the launch phase because we are the guys who need to call a bunch of media and do some song and dance and launch a product. And the next day you're all over the papers and the other day you disappear. So what we do is to take that coverage of one day to the business room and say, okay, we are successful. We launched the vehicle. But what we started realizing when you do that is the business after a month is facing a challenge selling the product in the market and we are nowhere there in the discussion because you just launched a product. You just made an announcement of a price and you just published technical specifications. That's about what you did. So what we started realizing is we need to enter at the phase where we call it as FFT, fact-finding trip. So in a product launch, like I mentioned, um, automotive industry is really complex when it comes to it, and it takes anywhere close to five years to build a product for us. So it's not a day's affair. So we started getting involved at the fact-finding trip to really understand the purpose of that product and try to be advisors on the right positioning and how it could be perceived. And that's when we started getting more attention from the business. So that's when the business looked at us and said, with your influencers, would you be able to position these aspects of the product? And we started measuring those aspects. Have we delivered the right message? Have we positioned the product right? And it's nothing to do with share of voice. It's nothing to do with how much coverage you have generated. Did I deliver the right message? 
And that's when the attention started coming to PR. And the second thing that happens with PR, as per our industry especially, because we face issues and crisis on a daily basis, and they know that you've got to control it, but there's no way we can measure what we stopped. So when you go back to the business and say, okay, there are two articles, negative articles, but we stopped around 10 of them, how do you show that to them? What's the validation point to the business? So stop talking about what you stopped and start talking about how do you address the issue became more and more important for us. I think these are the measurements which are helping us sit in the boardroom. Yes, uh, the excellence, the vanity metrics that you spoke about, or the metrics that we measure ourselves as communications professionals, SOVs, tonality, message penetration, they're very good for a month-on-month -month report to the CEO. It says, okay, we are doing well, or we are trying to position. But what we are starting to do is also look at brand ranking. So if there is a thought leadership subject, for, uh, for us, electrification is one of the most important subject because the chairman of Renault Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance is one of the top speakers about electrification and autonomous drive, and that becomes an important topic. How often is your name associated with this topic as a thought leader becomes one of the most important metrics that we measure on a monthly basis. How many times an article which is written on the industry about these trends is quoting Nissan as one of the major player. And then we are today facing the challenge of tech companies. As you know, Google wants to launch a car or Microsoft wants to launch a car. So we are moving away from just being in the auto industry by actually looking at the trends that are influencing the market. So the way we are looking at right now is what are the trends, what are the things that are influencing a car purchase, and are we figuring in those discussions, and how do we really measure that? And targeting becomes very important when you do that. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Carly. Carly, if you can share some of your experience from very different industries and what happens when the report finally lands on people's desks. It's very varied, the response to reporting. Uh, today I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, our experience providing insight to a wide variety of industries. And I, I think uh, not, uh, we don't talk enough about how insights and measurement is sold at, at summits like this. And I think it's a very, very critical part of, of everything that you discussed in your presentation, Marion. The client conversation needs to actually iron out those pain points and it needs to actually address fear of measurement. It actually needs to address vanity metrics and maybe why they're really, really important because at some times vanity metrics can be very strategic in your organisation for the internal battles and that sort of thing. So they do have a place. Um, I think that um, a lot of companies like ours haven't spent enough time looking at the way that we approach our clients and those first conversations that we have about measurement. We love what we do. We are so passionate about the reporting and we jump to the end without asking what keeps you up at night and what gets you out of bed every morning. Because I think if you've covered those two things, you've actually addressed fear of measurement, you've actually addressed business outcomes, business problems, and you can actually, I guess, design a way to address all of those things in a holistic way. Um, I guess another thing, and, and from an Icentia point of view, but also from an industry point of view, we do celebrate success. The awards last night, so much fun. Congratulations to everybody. But the case studies that will emerge online after that, uh, we pour over them to learn as much as we can about the best, best practice work that's going on. But not many of them will talk about failure. Mm. And I think that we have to be, open ourselves up to be courageous ourselves as the providers of, of measurement and insight to really have that conversation with our clients and be courageous enough to say, you may not like what you see, but we will really strive to help and change your business for the, the better. So it starts at the very, very start of the conversation and that the end report should be reflective of the valuable conversations we've, we've had at the start, which should really address the fears and concerns up front. Um, I think 
Yeah, everyone's at a different point, really, and I think that we rush in because measurement's so exciting and we see all the benefits, but at some times it can be just a, viewed as an additional performance review that we're actually going to charge you for at the end. And I think that we need to really provide more to our clients and provide more value around the whole conversation and what we deliver. Uh, some of the traps and, and this an endless list of where we see fear and vanity playing a detrimental role in providing great insight to our clients is where we do have multiple cuts of reports, where we do get requests for editable versions of reports. And I'm happy to be as flexible as we can be, but the actual, the motivation here is that we haven't had the quality conversations up front, we haven't addressed fears, and things are being changed along the way to remove negative coverage or obscure market, well, market share or things like that. And I think that that's something that we really need to be honest about, that we need to take a firm stand about, and, and really offer something that addresses the fear of measurement in a more sensitive way. I think we've been insensitive in the past. Thank you. Christopher, fashion not short of an ego, yep. as we said. <laughs> How do you deal with people's um, different needs and uh, different data sets as well? Because you've got a lot of data within the business yep. you need to access. So I think um, my main challenge really is I got myself into a company wherein I'm surrounded by data scientists, engineers by profession. They're all about data and measuring. So we actually measure, you know, how much time you go into when a consumer goes to the website or the app. We, you know, we monitor um, what color, what brands you've seen. You know, we we really measure every single, um, you know, opportunity we have just to know our cons customer better. That puts a lot of pressure. Um, on me and my team to be able to deliver how, the, how does PR contribute to um, the success of Zalora. So I think for me it was, you know, it was a tall order to really go and say what are the things we can measure that goes beyond AVE, that goes beyond the usual suspects because some of them are still very traditional, we still have that, but we go beyond it by saying let's look at the impact of what we do. So I think I have a couple of examples in my mind right now. One of them is a Muslim wear is a big category for us because we're in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. And um, whenever we do the launch of Zalia, our in-house brand, we see a lot of impressions or visits on the landing page of this specific brand. But we're also seeing that, uh, you know, it's not converting into sales. I mean, we have, for example, 10 million visits, but how much of that was converted into sales? So conversion was a very important part of um, the equation for us. So now we went and asked the question, why are they not converting? Um, are we showing the right kind of brand? So we asked our data you know, scientists, colleagues, to go and dig deeper on what are the skews that are getting more coverage uh, in terms of the media coverage? What are the images that was used? Because we, when we send out stuff, we send out basically all the key looks. And then what are the ones that use more often to get really an insight on what people in fashion are talking about or what are being heroed and what people are really interested in. And that put a different twist to our role to be able to give insight on what really connects to the consumer, and when we found out where we're missing, uh, for example, we found out that a lot of people are looking into um, young designers, because we also collaborate with young designers uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia. We suddenly changed track in the tone of how we started talking about our Muslim wear and modest wear category. We suddenly positioned ourselves as, you know, the, the narrative that we started playing was a narrative wherein we, you know, offer you the best of local um, modest wear styles and that we are a platform for local Malaysian or Indonesian designers and people started flocking. Now the conversion became better because people who are generally interested in this kinds of, uh, you know, um, products basically very locally driven, uh, suddenly going comes, comes to the website and started buying the product. So it really created an impact. And right now we're actually in the midst, which is the second um, you know, example, the midst of 
rebranding because I was talking yesterday about how we suddenly st changed strategy from just being a pure high street fashion player to really offering like bridge to luxury segments to get brands like Calvin Klein, Hugo Boss, you know, Coach, um, so and so forth to be on the website. We needed to have a different segment. We needed to have a different set of audience. And so the insight on how do we attract and change um, our customer segment because you know, 60, 70% with them will be very young. It can be uh, 25 and below because of the f initial offerings that we had. But to change it drastically to a more 25 to 35 segment, how do we do this? And this is where PR comes into play, wherein we started talking, we wanted to target really um, more of the you know publications that matter to this segment but at the same time it's are we starting to convert them slowly by the kind of tone the image that we put so it's really about measuring that and when we started to change our social media strategy from you know getting cat videos uh, every now and then has a big hello mondays <laughs> and because those generates a lot of clicks <laughs> and engagement but that's not what we want and uh, it was a uh, you know I've, it's a bitter pill to swallow, but I said, you know, we're gonna take the hit, and when we change guidelines, when we start, you know, curating really the images that we've put, the tone of the language we put on social media, um, we needed to have a smarter way of doing this, and that's really on brand. And so we did, and we suffered a lot of, uh, along the way, you know, for the first three to four months, or, um, you know, Christopher, I'm just going to stop you sure. there for a bit and just see if we have any questions. We've got the last few minutes and I'm okay. getting the, we need to kind of wrap up very soon. So, um, but you have no shortage of data at all. Yep. In fact, you have an expectation yep. that you will dive into more and more of it and pressure around you to yep. be very sophisticated at using it. Um, any questions from the audience relative to this topic for any of our speakers? Right at the back there, thank you. And down the front. I will take this one down the front while you've got a microphone. Shall I start? Please do. Uh, so we, we talked earlier. I'm Karen from Midas PR Group. Actually, I'm, I'm uh, addressing myself to uh, the person from Zalora. I wanted to know how you tracked and what was the success of the Diva TV show that you are sponsoring? So, sorry? You know, you have a TV show okay, which yes. is relooking people, revamping people, yes. and uh, the Zalora collection is is the one that is being used. Yep. And I wanted to know if that has been a success. Yep. So uh, this is a show called How Do I Look Asia? So it's actually a uh, show that was taken from the U.S. Uh, the way we track it, um, it's very primitive actually. So using a promo code. So whenever we flash you know the show there's always insert to say um to get the look you know use style tips to get discount um and we measured it was a success because uh, at the end of the day um we actually generated um i can't disclose the amount but surprisingly well in terms of uh, the number of um the number of uh, the number of orders that was generated using the code so the code actually worked. Mm -hmm. um, we had, you know, um, hundreds and thousands of orders generated mm. across the six markets based on the code, um, and it really, you know, was effective in positioning the brand as a go-to website for all your style um, right. <laughs> fixes. We take that question right at the back there. Hi, uh, I'm Piyush from Impact India. Uh, great presentation, Marion. Uh, my question is. Uh, while we talk about vanity and ego, uh, speaking from an Indian perspective, uh, could it be more cultural? Because if you look in India, if you look at a marketer or a CEO, they usually come from one of the top B schools, they share an alum. The only outlier in that is a, maybe a corporate communication professional. So is it that a lot of it is being inhibited, uh, a measurement, by the inability of a Copcom guy to sell measurement in the boardroom? Uh, you know, I think my, my short answer to it would be that vanity and ego are human truths, not cultural truths. They cross all cultural barriers, certainly, but mm. you're also referring to the background, you know, education background of people as well. And I, I mentioned that when I got to Japan, I had the very same findings, is you're seeing people who are generalists, have not come from a specialist marketing or communication background, who are less comfortable 
with challenging, used to demanding more short-term metrics, where you perhaps may not get the same uh, rigor around the analysis or diving in behind the numbers to prove it. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, but what I was saying is maybe CEOs are more receptive to something that a marketing guy brings in, uh, uh, rather than what a Copcom guy, uh, the numbers are the Copcom guy, because I'm assuming that even a marketing guy doesn't get great numbers quarter after quarter or a sales guy, but then maybe they're just able to sell their failure better. I, th I think that really is um, a very good point because as, as somebody that's involved in talking to clients and getting the right level within a client organisation to find that right contact, it makes a, a very big difference in the acceptance of failure. The, uh, the desire for metrics that will tell me what this really means mm -hmm. rather than vanity. So we always try and get to the C-suite uh, when we're having those client conversations, but that really is out of reach in a lot of, a lot of different markets for us. So mm -hmm. it, it's an aspiration in many ways, but we do see that it is a, is a great path to more strategic uh, insights. i just add to that, yes. yes, culture does play a big role, especially because I handle India and I handle Southeast Asia right now, and we see a great challenge, especially in markets like Thailand and Indonesia, where they usually do not like to really sit in the executive room. Mm -hmm. right. So communications, it all depends on what level the head of communication is in, and what kind of trust they have already built with the with the executives. Sometimes language is a big barrier because most of the time we have CEOs who are not from the local country because it's a multinational company and the communications person is from the local country who is supposed to deliver everything in the vernacular but is expected to report in English. And there it, it's, a, it's a completely different game altogether. And we do suffer from that. So I do agree, to a large extent, culture does, and language does a play mm, role. Right, so. Indeed, yeah. Final question down the front here, Colin. Thank you, Marion. Uh, yeah, Colin, I'm sit on the board of ANAC. Um, I've worked uh, internationally for many, many years. I've always lived and worked out of London, and I've worked in many Asian, uh, worked with projects that have been based in many Asian countries. And one of the things that I used to experience, though it's less true now, is that in some Asian cultures, there's a very big hurdle to get to admit, actually, we haven't achieved what we were going to achieve. We, ha we are admitting failure, especially to a client or to somebody who's much senior or older than you are. So Carly made a point about we don't talk enough about how we sell measurement. And one of those things is because we don't really talk about the positive aspects of failure. Yeah. So Carly and, and Marion, from your point of view, is selling this to agencies. Uh, as an agency's voice, but also then we have clients, what would, what would work as an argument for you? Is it about risk management? Is it about actually saying we're honest enough to speak truth to power? Um, or is it, this is a tool we can use to fix? Or is it something else? What, what's the most compelling message from your perspective as both buyers and sellers of measurement in terms of what works? I think all of those approaches can work. Uh, the one that we use uh, is really to start small. And I think that most people that have, uh, have progressed very, very well in their measurement journey have started on those small steps. So that's not a jump to we're going to change your business overnight because we've got some great data for you. It's about how about we look at this first campaign and we'll tweak what you need to know about this campaign and then we might look at ongoing work. So it very much is small steps for, for new clients on uh, a sales strategy. Um, really, when you're looking at some a new contact coming in, and Mary and I discussed this a lot, that it is a great opportunity when, from the client side, somebody comes into a new role, so they are not inhibited, they don't fear measuring what has gone on in the past, and they can create their own baseline. So we're always looking for that movement within our clients because it presents an opportunity that someone will come in with absolute fearlessness and say, look, I want to know what's going on, but I have no emotional or professional attachment to what has happened in the past. And that's when you get honest conversations and, and really powerful insights. And just to finally add to that and wrap up, I, I play to pride. I do use ego and, 
and vanity and encouraging people to be proud of what communications can achieve and stand up and claim credit for it. Mm. Having come from a client side where I've worked right across the marketing mix, there is no shortage of marketers who are chest beating saying, it was the advertising, it was my brilliant insight or something, while the PR person slumps away saying, it probably wasn't the PR, it was too small a spend. And yet, when I share published papers proving the ROI of PR up against advertising, digital, in-store promotions, and so on, people don't want to take them. I speak to PR societies across Asia when I'm traveling typically and encourage them to take away a copy of the papers that prove what incredible impact and how cost-efficient PR is. And people are like, thanks, but it's all right. Just don't want to take it. Out. And so I just play to that pride is you should actually realize what a fantastic skill set you bring, how cost effective you are in an organization to build business measures and play to that. Thank you. Barry, I see you're ready to um, thank the panel and wrap us up, right? <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>